It was a moonless night over Washington State. The atmosphere inside the giant TU-4 bull was tense. They'd passed Vancouver an hour before, its lights just aglow to the west as they looped inland to mask their aircraft from distant radars. Just 20 minutes prior, they'd picked up some fuzzy signals on their rudimentary radar warning receivers. P-61s, the operator said. But no dark silhouettes had swooped in to end their mission and the electronic emissions had quickly faded out behind them. Now they were on their running, flying steady and making minute corrections as the bombardier called out over the intercom. Seattle's lights were bright in the cockpit glass. Bombay doors open, green lights across the board. Their wingmen peeled away to a safer distance. Three, two, one... Bombs away, a hard turn to port as the doors ease close on hydraulic rams, dulling the thundering noise of freezing high-altitude air rushing past. Goodbye, Seattle, the co-pilot whispers. No one else speaks. And in another world, that would have been the result. Between April 28th and May 10th, 1948, the Air Defence and Strategic Air Commands conducted a massive exercise that simulated bomber attacks across the continental United States. It was the largest test of US offensive-defensive capabilities since the Second World War and the first of the nuclear age. The 505th Aircraft Control and Warning Group and F-61 Black Widows had been deployed to McCord from Mitchell and Hamilton Air Bases in order to participate in the exercise. Tactical Air Command also contributed to the defending forces by dispatching a squadron of Lockheed F-80 Shooting Star jets to Spokane. Strategic Air Command assumed the offensive role with B-29 bombers. When the war games ended, all agreed that US air defences were woefully inadequate. In simple terms, had the B-29s been enemy aircraft, the Northwest would have been hard hit. The F-80 day fighters lacked range and were not equipped with electronic equipment necessary to take off and intercept B-29s when the super fortresses attacked under cover of bad weather. Black Widows fared no better. The World War II vintage fighters, referred to as all-weather aircraft, did not have the speed to close with the bombers even though the B-29 was also considered obsolete by the Air Force. They also lacked the de-icing equipment required for bad weather operations. Compounding the problems, a lack of qualified ground control intercept officers forced enlisted personnel to act as controllers in addition to performing their radio operation and maintenance duties. Too few radars could be deployed, and moreover, those that did were out of date. The issue of radar coverage will be tackled initially through the construction of 10 radar sites largely using surplus World War II radars and a single control centre in Alaska. In 1949 this was extended via the funding of 85 permanent radar installations and 10 air control centres in Canada and the northern United States to be completed by 1952. The interceptor requirement was harder to rush through. In fairness to the US Air Force, it had recognised the need for a more potent, faster and higher flying all-weather interceptor in the late stages of the Second World War. That programme was underway as the 1948 exercises were taking place. Although it is easy to stand back and hurl rocks at the strategic decisions that the USAF made in that period, we have to also recognise that they were dealing with an awe-inspiring rate of change. To put it into perspective, when Imperial Japan attacked Pearl Harbour on December 7th 1941, the premier US Army Air Force fighter was the P-40B Warhawk. Now the Warhawk was a tough fighter with just enough about it to resist the superior Japanese Zero and Ki-43. Upgraded versions were a reasonable match for the German Bf-109 in the Western Desert in 1942. It was an acceptable, if unexceptional, early war piston engine fighter. Just four years later, the newly minted USAF had as its frontline fighter and interceptor the P-80 Shooting Star. Although essentially the same size as the Warhawk, the Shooting Star was 40% heavier, 70% faster and could climb at nearly twice the rate to an altitude 60% higher. The only thing that hadn't fundamentally changed in those four years was the basic armament of the USAF fighter, which had evolved from two 50 caliber and 430 caliber machine guns on the Warhawk to six 50 calibers on the Shooting Star. And this was just the start of a tidal wave of technology coming ashore in 1945. The USAF specification for its next generation interceptor included a radar that could detect a bomber-sized aircraft 20 to 30 miles away in all weathers, a computer control fire control system that would automatically engage that target with a battery of rockets having been steered into position by an advanced autopilot. None of these systems existed in 1945, yet they formed the specification of what would eventually become the F-89 Scorpion. 
until that aircraft, originally due in 1949 but endlessly delayed, overcame its gestational challenges, the defence of the continental United States rested with the exhausted fleet of thoroughly obsolete Northrop Black Widows and the ambitious but also obsolete P-82 Twin Mustang. Sack's exposure of the paucity of this combination in repelling a Soviet bomber attack caused a rapid re-evaluation of the situation. On the 8th of August 1948, the USAF published a general operational requirement for an all-weather jet interceptor. Early availability was the priority, rather than the capability to counter any threat beyond the Tu-4, which, as a reminder, is a close copy of the B-29 Superfortress. Just a week later, on the 14th, the Air Force directed Lockheed to produce a two-seat, radar-equipped version of the two-place trainer version of the Shooting Star. Recognising this was a contingency aircraft, the Air Force also re-endorsed the F-89 Scorpion program. At this time, the new aircraft was simply seen as a version of the P-80. It wouldn't receive its own designation until later. The program proceeded at a pace. The first radar-equipped TF-80 took to the air in April 1949. On the 1st of July, a more evolved aircraft took flight, this time based on the TF-33 trainer and featuring a radar-equipped nose and afterburners in the rear fuselage. Production of 109 F-94As was already underway as the flight test program proceeded, a sign of the extreme urgency of the Air Force's needs. Just imagine this kind of speed on an aircraft program today. This urgency only ramped up when the Soviet Union announced that it had successfully detonated an atomic bomb on August 29, 1949. The size of the F-94 by increased with that news, first to 288 aircraft and then to 368. After a multitude of teething problems, principally with the J-33 engines, the F-94A finally entered service in the summer of 1950, six months behind schedule. This was a thoroughly conventional aircraft. Its ability to target other aircraft at night was provided by an ANAPG-33 radar with about a 5-10 to 10 mile range. An E-1 fire control computer steered the pilot on the intercept course. The common Sperry A-1C gun sight helped him hit the target. Although an improvement over the Black Widow, it was still a rudimentary system. Because of this, the F-94A would have engaged Soviet bombers in much the same way as the Shooting Star, the only difference being that it could attack at night, and in theory also in bad weather. Now I've gone into some detail on these pursuit curves in other videos, so I won't repeat too much here, but in essence the F-94s would be steered into position by ground control. Once the radar observer detected the bombers on the fighter's own radar, the pilot would use the afterburner to climb up high above the bomber formations and then dive down on a course that allowed them to attack the beam of their chosen target. If the weather was particularly bad, then they would attack from the rear or on a level course from the side. Both of these attack patterns, however, exposed the interceptors to a much higher volume of defensive fire if they were spotted on their run-in. This was a particular issue for the F-94A as it was armed with only four 50 caliber machine guns. Although good in a dogfight with another fighter due to their rate of fire and reliability, the lightness of the 50 caliber bullet made it a poor weapon against bombers. This was particularly an issue against the bull as it carried eight 23mm cannons in four twin turrets. Although it would realistically take several passes for an F-94 to critically damage the bull, one hit from the 23mm was likely to severely damage the fighter. Remarkably, this wasn't actually the most significant issue with the F-94A. Besides its unreliable engines, which had a worrying tendency to eat their own turbine blades, the F-94's fuel system was temperamental. At altitude, its handling was best described as sluggish and bordering on the terrifying. None of these things were even the worst problem. No, that was reserved for the ejection seats. Because of the cramped cabin in the converted trainer, the F-94A was hard for pilots and radar observers to get into during alerts. Worse still, the tight clearance led to several tragic accidents on ejection. Despite the fact that in 1949 the aircraft demonstrated its potential by successfully finding, targeting and destroying a target drone without actually ever acquiring it visually, Pilots and squadron commanders quickly lost faith in the F-94A. It wasn't regularly ready to fly, and when it was, it was a death trap. They were transferred to the Air National Guard in 1951, and they were gone from the inventory by 1954. Further up the chain of command, though, the importance of the F-94 was becoming more obvious to planners with each passing month. If the Soviet Union could strike the US mainland with impunity, then the President's options were much limited in the event of a crisis. Unfortunately, the desired rocket armament and associated fire control system was unavailable. 
The F-94B was therefore a relatively minor update on the A, featuring some quality of life upgrades like an improved instrument landing system for night landings, a de-icing system for the windshield, and the relocation of the wingtip tanks to the fuselage to improve handling. But essentially the F-94B was as much of a dog as the A. It lacked sufficient de-icing gear to be a true all-weather fighter and its armament was still deficient. The engines were, at least, more consistently reliable. The Air Defence Command had no better option, so they accepted 356 of them, 176 in 1951 and 180 in 1952. The F-94 was the only version of the Starfighter C combat. Around 15 A-model F-94s were already allocated to the Far East Air Force during the early part of the Korean War, but were too unreliable to be deployed in a combat role. In March 1951, however, a handful of F-94Bs joined them in the theatre. Their small numbers meant it wasn't until December 1951 that they flew missions, when the 68th Fighter Interceptor Squadron posted two F-94s on strip alert at Suwon Air Force Base. Even then, the aircraft's involvement was limited to local air defence scrambles under positive ground control radar. The new F-94s were fitted with the latest fire control system, and the Air Force didn't want to fly them over enemy territory where the secret electronic equipment could be compromised. The restriction was not lifted until nearly a year later after continued B-29 losses were tied to the ineffectiveness of fighter escorts equipped with the older airborne intercept radars. So in November of 1952, the 319th Fighter Interceptor Squadron began using some of its F-94Bs as a screen between the Yalu and Chongyon rivers. Soon after, F-94s also flew within a 30-mile radius of the B-29 targets. Enemy planes usually retreated rather than come up against the F-94 barrier patrols. Over the remainder of the war, the F-94B proved to be one of the more reliable aircraft of the Korean War, even in poor weather and darkness. Besides B-29 escort duties and the interception of enemy fighters, the F-94s protected B-26 light bombers and could fly deep into North Korea when other aircraft were grounded due to bad weather. Korean veterans as a rule praised the F-94. It was considered rugged and could fly many hours without maintenance. The raw statistics are perhaps a little less appealing. 28 F-94s were lost during the war, two of them from accidents during interceptions. The first of these was an F-94 that stalled after shooting down a slow-moving PO-2 biplane and crashed into the Yellow Sea. The second was during a high-altitude interception of a MiG-15 in which the F-94 collided with the MiG, destroying both aircraft. As with many of the statistics about US Air Force losses, there are certainly grey areas around the non-combat losses that claim the others. Based on the previous analysis of Sabre losses that I've done, I'd say there are as many as five further F-94 losses that could be due to MiGs, but it's hard to tell for sure. There were just two additional kills for the type for a total of four. A piston-engined LA-9 fighter was destroyed on the cold black night of the 30th of January 1953. The pilot and observer in the F-94 never saw the enemy plane until it burst into flames. This was, incidentally, the only confirmed kill made with the E-1 fire control system. In fact, I believe it to be the only kill made with any of the E-series systems. A second MiG-15 was destroyed in a dogfight at about 4 in the morning on the 10th of May 1953. The weather that day was terrible. Heavy rain with 300 foot visibility. Even so, having snuck up on the MiGs, the two F-94s became entangled in a turning fight that carried them from 30,000 feet to 15,000 and ended when the lead F-94 shot down one of the MiGs and the other one bugged out back to base. The F-94 proved to be no slouch in that turning fight. Although the afterburner on the J-33 engine was quite slow to respond, it did give the aircraft roughly equal thrust-to-weight ratio to the MiG-15. Was it a better dogfighter? Not in the round, but the difference wasn't as big as the swept-wing mafia would have you believe. Even so, the F-94B was a thoroughly compromised aircraft, even in its primary mission. It had been phased out of the frontline US inventory by 1954 and from the Air National Guard by 1957. The final version of the F-94 was a much more radical redesign of the base shooting star, so much so that the USAF's original intention was to redesignate it F-97. Dynamically, a new Pratt & Whitney J-48 engine was fitted along with thinner wings featuring increased dihedral. The sweep of the horizontal stabiliser increased, dive flaps were fitted, fuel capacity increased and the aircraft could now be refuelled from a single point versus the two fillers on the A and B. That sounds small, but it did improve handling on the ground and thus turnaround time, which is important for an interceptor. The nose was extended to incorporate new systems. Thermal de-icing now extended to the wing and tail control surfaces. 
And in general, all of these changes contributed to a more stable, flyable, and in theory, reliable aircraft. Despite all of this, though, the, the biggest change was in the firepower, which finally realised the original vision for the type. The all-rocket armament accommodated 48 two and three quarter inch folding fin aerial rockets, 24 in a ring of firing tubes around the nose, and eventually 24 in two cylindrical pods, one located on each of the two wings, midway between root and tip. All of this was directed by a new Hughes E5 fire control system and the Westinghouse W3A autopilot to direct the fighter to the best firing point. In 1950, this definitive F-94C version of the type was given a new name, Starfire. Perhaps unsurprisingly, all of this new technology took a steady, underarm but readily available platform and created a hot mess of converged new technology that quite simply didn't work as promised. The success of the F-94C's all-rocket armament hinged on rocket accuracy and interceptor performance reliability. The F-94C and its rockets had neither of these. The new engine proved to be as unreliable as that in the early A. Afterburners cracked and nozzles warped, leading to a substantial redesign of the whole engine. Performance never matched what was promised. Worse still, the engine flamed out when the full nose load of 24 rockets was salvoed above 25,000 feet. If only 12 rockets were fired, a near flameout still occurred that slowed the interceptor's speed. Firing any rockets blinded the crew for several seconds, not ideal when at close quarters with an enemy bomber. The Air Force wanted the problems cured and the rocket load doubled, which resulted in the installation of the wing pods with the additional 24 rockets. Each pod packed 24 two and three quarter inch rockets into, into cylindrical pods measuring 9 foot 6 inches in length. The fiberglass nose cover protruded about six feet from the wing's leading edge, and before the rockets left the pods, the covers would disintegrate due to pressure from the rocket exhaust. Quite how the F-94C handled with the blunt pods post-firing isn't documented, but I can't imagine it was particularly good for dynamics. Fortunately, the destructive power of these rockets was considerable. In a one-second firing pass, the B-model's quad-50 calibre machine guns put 3.7 kilograms of projectiles onto a target. The C could salvo fire 24 rockets in under half a second, giving a throw weight of 127 kilos of projectiles, of which nearly 15 kilos was explosive. In other words, the potential destructive force of the F-94C was more than 30 times that of the F-94B, to the extent that if just one rocket hit the target it would cause more damage than a complete firing pass by the B. The E5 fire control system included the same A and APG-40 set that was installed in the D-model Scorpion. The ANAPG-40 was a 250 kilowatt set with a range of about 30 miles. This gave it greater range than the 200 kilowatt set in the contemporary Gloucester Javelin, which was only capable of detecting a fighter size target at about 20 miles. The E5 can control automatic tracking and firing, either from a tail chase pursuit curve or from beam on. There was no head on option. This important feature was introduced in the E6 that equipped the F-89D Scorpion. Practically, that meant a continuing high workload for ground controllers who would have to work harder to position hundreds of starfires on the appropriate vectors. It also meant that the emergence of the M4 Bison in 1954 made the F-94 essentially obsolete overnight, as it had an insufficient performance fraction to consistently make a successful interception. Even with these limitations, the F-94C was an expensive aircraft. Cost per unit ballooned from about $248,000 in the F-94A to $196,000 in the B to $534,073 for the definitive F-94C. 387 C-model Starfires were delivered between March 1953 and May 1954. It arrived with less enthusiasm than expected, despite the Flash Gordon name and all-rocket armament. Nearly two years behind schedule, it showed limited performance and was dogged by reliability issues. Poor weatherproofing and leaky fuel tanks reduced sortie rates. The E5 fire control system was unreliable and hard to use. This was a persistent problem with the E5 and eventually an optical site was fitted as a backup. Despite its mediocre performance, the F-94C lasted a long time as a first-line interceptor. The Air Force wanted to get rid of the aircraft but could ill afford to. Due to ongoing issues with the F-89 and delays to the F-102, the F-94C in mid-1954 was still regarded as the best two-man interceptor at low altitudes. The F-94C did finally disappear from the USAF roles in early 1959 and from the Air National Guards in middle 1960. So how should we judge the Starfire? On the face of it, it seems like a frivolous waste of resources, a stop-gap aircraft that arrived too late with too many flaws to actually stop said gap. 
It was in service for about 10 years and was generally held in low regard throughout. Many were lost in accidents, some of which are still unresolved today. That said, the aircraft was so advanced that one was abducted by aliens. On the other hand, we need to recognise it as an aircraft of firsts. The first American fighter with an afterburner, the first to deliberately engage and destroy an enemy fighter without visual contact, the first to feature an all-rocket armament. Technologically, the F-94 was a flying testbed for a range of technologies that would be the backbone of the US interceptor community for two decades. It took the brunt of the bad news story so that other aircraft would be able to succeed. It is also important to see the F-94 against the wider strategic backdrop. At a moment the US found itself undefended, the early model Starfires were available and operational when everything else was delayed or on the drawing board. For more than two years it was the strategic option that increased Truman's and later Eisenhower's political manoeuvre room in a time of geopolitical turmoil. Can we put a ticket price on those strategic benefits? Not easily, but we can be sure that they are worth something. Do they outweigh the financial and human cost of the F-94 Starfire's short but troubled service? Hard to say. What close examination of the Starfire does remind us is that judging military programs from a great distance in time and culture can mislead us into believing that some things are misguided or wasteful or short-sighted, and that others are works of great genius that called the path of history correctly. Things are rarely so black and white. Things are things. <laughs>